Zeeman splitting of common elements uh, I am showing you now, because uh, uh, there are uh, several classes uh, of elements where the Zeeman splitting is shown schematically. So, for example, on the top of this uh, slide what you will be seeing class N that is uh, barium, beryllium, calcium etcetera. I have, I have written the wavelengths that is atomic absorption wavelengths for these elements here. And then uh, here it contains silicon, tin, strontium, vanadium etcetera. Zeeman splitting of almost all elements have been um, um, have been uh, studied since last uh, more than 100 years. So, you can also see uh, we have here class, uh, class 1 0 and then uh, we have class for class 1 f here and then 2 o, 2 0, 3 0 etcetera. These are different classes typical notations for the Zeeman splitting. For example, if you see here selenium, uh, selenium and tellurium, the Zeeman splitting will be occurring like this. So, the upwards and downward signals represent polarization. Okay. And here you can see uh, for selenium and uh, tellurium, there are the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pi components, phi sigma and phi. Uh, sigma plus and phi sigma minus. Similarly, for chromium, iron, molybdenum etcetera, we have Zeeman splitting occurring and their wavelengths are indicated here. You do not have to remember these numbers for uh, examination um, or test, because in general if you are remembering that some elements are having normal Zeeman effect and some uh, elements are having anomalous Zeeman effect that should be good enough for your practice of atomic absorption. Similarly, we have class 3 0 that is arsenic and antimony, others are aluminum etcetera, uh, most of the other elements are defined here, the splitting is shown here. So, um, if the magnetic field is applied at right angles to the radiation beam, pi component is polarized parallel to the applied field and sigma components are polarized perpendicular to the applied field. This is what I was uh, uh, telling you that whenever there is a magnetic field around the flame, the radiation from hollow cathode lamp splits into pi component and sigma component and I need a polarizer. Okay, polarizer to separate the sigma and pi components, otherwise you will not be able to see the effect of magnetic field. Okay. So, this configuration is known as transverse Zeeman effect. That means, put a magnetic field and put a polarizer perpendicular to the applied field. Okay. So, this configuration is known as transverse Zeeman field and if you put the polarizer, um, if the magnetic field is parallel to the radiation beam, then it is called longitudinal Zeeman effect. That means, if the flame is like this, you put the flame the magnet around it and transverse is flame is like this, you put the magnetic field up and below, top and below that is transverse Zeeman effect and if you put along the flame uh, horizontal, then it is longitudinal Zeeman effect. In this component, pi component is mixing because uh, only two sigma components are seen with 50 percent intensity. So, this is the schematics of the Zeeman effect. The I have to tell you at this stage that uh, Zeeman effect background correction is one of the most important development in the atomic absorption spectrometry. And uh, the signal measured is always less than the normal atomic absorption signal, because the absorption line is split into two or three components and we measure only one component that is pi component or sigma component. And uh, 
the arrangement of atoms uh, I am making it clear to you in this slide that is um, this is the atomic vapor or flame and the poles of the magnet are arranged perpendicular parallel to this. Okay. This is without magnetic field and this is again with magnetic field this is perpendicular this is horizontal this is sorry this is horizontal this is perpendicular and this effect is known as transverse Zeeman effect here it is split into pi which is 50 percent stronger signal sigma plus and sigma minus are uh, without the are on the left hand um, uh, long shorter wavelength and longer wavelength ranges and when the, without the magnetic field my signal is double double than this double than this and it is like this and in the magnetic if I put a uh, long in the longitudinal effect this pi component completely vanishes only the sigma plus and sigma minus are visible. Okay. Now, is this clear to you? If it is not clear what I want you to do is imagine a flame and put two boxes uh, around it and put two boxes uh, on the top and bottom of the, uh, of the flame and then you should imagine that this signal is split into three one is pi one is sigma plus and another is minus without the uh, signal without the magnets only one signal is obtained and in longitudinal Zeeman effect pi component is missing. And so, you will see only two sigma components and that is the central uh, line is missing. Okay. So, when the magnetic field is applied to the radiation source to the radiation source now we are talking about earlier I we were talking about the apply application of magnetic field to the uh, flame where atomic vapor is uh, disturbed whereas, now I am talking about magnetic field applied to the radiation source that means, hollow cathode lamp itself. Okay, to the hollow cathode lamp if I apply a magnetic field then it is known as direct Zeeman effect the magnetic field can also be applied to the atomic cloud. This I we have already seen this is known as inverse Zeeman effect. So, both these effects have been used in atomic absorption to a large extent and uh, both are possible nowadays uh, uh, transverse Zeeman effect is uh, uh, more employed that is to the hollow cathode lamp itself or we can do it in the uh, flame uh, also and even in electrochemical electrothermal atomic absorption I want uh, you to remember that uh, Zeeman effect uh, is uh, used very effectively for, hollow, for uh, electrothermal atomic absorption because it extends the determination levels to parts per billion level. PPB. So, in the inverse Zeeman effect the energy levels of the absorbing species are split absorbing atoms in the inverse Zeeman effect that is atomic cloud. The at atoms and energy of the atoms are split and the absorbance values also change since the sigma components are rotated out of the radiation line by putting a uh, polarizer and only pi component absorbs which can be measured. Okay. Now, for the direct Zeeman effect absorption can be measured at both sigma and pi component wavelengths also. That means, in the direct one both are all the measurements are absorbed all the wavelengths and in the inverse Zeeman effect only the pi component may ab is absorbed is measured. So, if a magnetic field is applied by a permanent magnet or via a direct current then a rotating polarizer must be uh, applied 
to measure the total absorbance. That means, I apply a magnetic field, permanent magnetic field or I can generate a temporary magnetic field by passing current also. This effect is known, it is a physical a physics uh, uh, theory that you can generate magnets by passing electric current through a um, magnet and a rotating polarizer I must apply then I can measure the total absorbance. So, by applying alternating current, alternating magnetic field is generated which splits the energy levels only when the field is on. That means, AC current and uh, uh, the field is on the it splits the energy when AC is not on the there is 0 current and the, the uh, Zeeman effect is not there. That means, you can measure the total background as well as the signal using these things. Mm, uh, thus, 8 possible combinations are possible. What are those 8 combinations? One is uh, I have made a small table here, location of the magnet, orientation of the magnet, parallel or perpendicular, type of the magnetic field and part particularities. So, at the radiation source, if I apply uh, magnetic field, I can apply parallel or perpendicular to that to the radiation source hollow cathode lamp. Then type of magnet it can be constant, alternating, constant or alternating that is with AC without AC. Uh, direct one is a constant means direct current, another is with AC. Then if it is constant I need a rotating polarizer. If I uh, use uh, alternating magnetic field using AC current I do not need a polarizer. This is a little tricky to understand. But I think uh, most of you will uh, appreciate if you look at this uh, table a little critically. So, suppose I go for perpendicular uh, um, uh, arrangement, then also I can have a constant uh, magnetic field or alternating magnetic field. In the case of constant magnetic field, I need a rotating polarizer and alternating field, I need a fixed polarizer. Okay, because it is permanent. So, at the atomizer that means, at the on the flame I can have similar combinations. Uh, what I have here parallel is same as this and it is constant not applicable in atomic absorption. Inverse um, Zeeman effect is not applicable in atomic absorption, but alternating uh, current I can use to generate the parallel magnetic field that is longitudinal in that case I do not need a polarizer. Okay. Though I can have another combination that is perpendicular and here I have two possibilities one is rotating polarizer another is fixed polarizer these particularities you need not remember, but these things can be uh, determined easily. Okay. So, Atomic absorption spectrophotometers require inverse Zeeman effect that is magnet at the hollow cathode lamp, uh, magnet at the sorry uh, magnet at the atomizer are preferable, but for that we need a rotating polarizer if constant magnet is used therefore, alternating magnet I can use comfortably. So, in this configuration absorbance is measured with field of that means, no magnetic field total absorbance and with field on the uh, lines are split pi is missing. So, only the background correction background data is obtained you understand the logic field on pi is pi component is uh, absorbance is measured and uh, pi components are missing. Uh, okay, that is uh, sigma components of pi is on, sigma is off, and in field off, uh, the uh, the absorbance from the uh, pi component is missing. 
because we put a polarizer. So, with field off and field on we measure the normal atomic absorption and field on we measure the background absorption. absorption. So, if you subtract normal A s from the background is this is what you get the signal for the atomic absorption. This is a true double beam technique without using hydrogen lamp because the in even in hydrogen lamp what we normally measure is without the aspiration in deuterium lamp without aspiration we measure the total absorbance with hollow cathode lamp we measure the actual absorbance from the atoms. So, we have to subtract similarly with Zeeman effect I do not need a hollow cathode lamp or uh, uh, sorry I do not need a um, deuterium lamp. This is true double beam technique because uh, both beams originate from the same source. So, any change in the uh, signal is automatically attenuated because with the field on I measure the uh, mm, I measure the background with the field off uh, I measure the background with the field on I measure only the background because the sigma are removed pi is rotated out. So, whatever is the remaining residual uh, uh, radiation I am measuring with field off I measure the normal AS. So, uh, it is just like deuterium lamp correction, but much better why we will see a bit later. So, the um, uh, measurements are made at the same frequency we follow the uh, they follow the same optical path and fall on the same detector. So, the sensitivity remains unaltered. So, this aspect is to be very clear to you because whenever you want to buy an atomic absorption spectrometer whenever you want to buy an atomic absorption spectrometer the manufacturers will give you a choice of uh, a background corrector. They will ask you sir do you need a deuterium lamp corrector or you need Zeeman effect or you need some other effect that some other effect is known as Smith Heath J uh, background correction method. And depending upon the background corrector you choose the cost of atomic absorption also will vary. So, it is important for you to understand the mechanism of background correction of deuterium lamp, mechanism of background correction of uh, um, Zeeman effect background Zeeman effect and the mechanism of background effect for the Smith if J background correction method. Relatively Smith if J background correction is somewhat of recent origin and uh, very few um, instruments are uh, uh, available nowadays quite a lot of instruments are available with Smith if J correction also. So, uh, what is Smith if J background correction method? This method is based on the self absorption behavior of radiation emitted from hollow cathode lamps when they are operated at high currents. I think you remember I had told you that whenever uh, during the introduction of atomic absorption that whenever there is a change uh, sodium lamp example I had given you there is change in the radiation that is the lamp is coming on and off on and off it is due to the absorbance of the free atoms generated in the sodium vapor lamp. So, sodium vapor lamp whenever you put it on the sodium will evaporate fill the lamp with lot of vapor from sodium atoms and they will uh, there will be a light uh, emission and after some time the absorb uh, the generated atoms sodium atoms will absorb the same radiation lamp puts off. This you had seen uh, you are even see you can even see in the street lights even now wherever sodium vapor lamps are on. Okay, as the temperature increases the absorbance increases this is known as self reversal. So, application of uh, so how do I increase the temperature in the hollow cathode lamp? What I do 
is at high temperature high current the, the hollow cathode lamps whenever I uh, operate with high current the self absorption behavior becomes more prominent because it gets heated more and the absorbance will be more. So, application of high current what does it do? It produces large concentrations of the unexcited atoms in the hollow cathode lamp. So, these atoms unexcited atoms I think you should remember this. These atoms are capable of absorbing the radiation produced from the hollow cathode lamp. It is just like eating its own uh, um, radiation. So, the uh, these atoms are capable of absorbing the radiation produced from the excited atomic species. So, high currents also broaden the emission lines of the excited species this is another property whenever I apply high current they broaden the emission lines of the excited species net effect what is the net effect of both these things is to produce a line that has a minimum at its center that is resonance line. That means, I take a hollow cathode lamp apply high current once and apply low current once. So, whenever I have low current there is no self absorption. Whenever there is high current lot of free atoms are produced they absorb the radiation and then the, um, the signal from the hollow cathode lamp becomes less. It is just like putting off the lamp and whenever it, it reaches minimum that is the background absorbance. Okay. So, this is another way of making the background correction net effect is to produce a line hollow cathode line that has minimum at its center that means, that is the background that is what is the center that is the resonance line. So, to obtain corrected absorbances the lamp is programmed to run alternately at normal and high currents what we do you uh, take the hollow cathode lamp apply low current and high current that is all we do and measure the absorbance when it is high current and measure the absorbance when it is low current. When it is low current it is background plus sample when it is high current it is only the background. So, subtract the two you will get the atomic absorption signal. So, at what frequency we do this? We do this at the alternately at very high frequency for almost every 5 milliseconds I change the current high and low high and low high and low every 5 milliseconds. So, what happens you can extrapolate the difference uh, of absorbance in the um, um, when you plot the absorbance curve the total amount of absorbance because it is cut cut cut. So, it, it will be like a square wave you can add up all that and draw a continuous curve that is some sort of theoretical exp exp uh, extrapolation and uh, during normal uh, operation background and atomic absorption data is provided. What do we do here? Normal operation no uh, extra atom generation no self reversal. So, the atomic absorption spec absorption data of the whole species is obtained. Second part when the absorption peak is at a minimum only the background is measured and the absorbance of the analyte is minimum. So, you subtract the two background is corrected that is what we have been discussing. So, in the atomic absorption why background because the background there is certain amount of absorbance at the resonance line from the flame and from the other elements that may be present to some extent that background correction must be subtracted from the sample atomic absorption. And there, there are three mechanisms one is deuterium lamp another is Zeeman effect and another is Smith F J effect. The Smith F J are the scientists who discovered this phenomenon and applied for the first time in atomic absorption measurements 
and these uh, this type of correction has come only since last uh, 20 years. The Z1 effect is there since last uh, 30 years. Hydrogen uh, deuterium uh, lamp uh, background correction is there since uh, almost 40, 45 years. Okay? But even now these things are being produced uh, and atomic absorption with all the three or any one of the three are usually marketed and you will have to choose um, the proper background correction whenever you want to buy an atomic absorption uh, system. Okay. So, the data acquisition uh, system in atomic absorption uh, I have already told you that most of the time computers are being employed and uh, plots and other things etcetera data everything is by computer nowadays and the data acquisition system automatically subtracts the two signals in Smith if j correction. We have been discussing Smith if j correction. So, normal observation background and atomic absorption and high current only background and we do a data acquisition system uh, that subtracts the two signals to give the corrected value. So, this is a simple remarkable means of background correction which compares very well with Zeeman effect method. Several instrument manufacturers offer Smith FJ technique for background correction. So, all these three are available. So, this is what happens here in the absorption at low current I have atomic absorption and in the high current level um, there is um, reversal and then only the atomic absorption difference is measured in the Smith if j correction. Okay. So, that is about atomic absorption in uh, um, background correction. So, we will not discuss anything further than that because there are other techniques that we need to discuss here and uh, it is important for us to understand what are the chemical reactions uh, taking place in atomic absorption interferences. Okay. So, any analytical technique for that matter uh, however sensitive any analytical technique is simple or rapid whatever is there it is not free from all interferences definitely it would not be free from all interferences this we have been discussing since quite some time now. So, analytical chemists uh, as analytical chemists or scientists we must be aware of the origin or the source of the interferences. Why? We have to provide an analytical data very accurately and precisely otherwise chem any ch chemical analysis will lose its meaning. So, atomic absorption spectrometry is one such analytical instrumental method and it has got much inherent interferences from the sample introduction stage onwards uh, to the detector level. Originally, it was thought that AS is free from interferences and I have also told you a number of times that it is almost free from interference. I never said it is totally free from interferences if you remember uh, my earlier uh, sessions, but um, um, it is uh, important that uh, we measure a uh, very narrow resonance line from the hollow cathode lamp passing through the atomizer either in the flame or in the non flame that is the electrothermal atomic absorption. So, the interferences we have already seen this the chemical reactions and the interferences may be classified as follows physical chemical ionization spectral and non specific. The physical interference occurs at the sample introduction stage and the remaining chemical ionization spectral and non specific interferences occur in the flame. Okay. So, physical interferences are uh, there in the uh, 
sample introduction stage this we have already discussed a little bit earlier and the it all depends upon viscosity, surface tension, vapor pressure etcetera and because of the transport all the elements are um, affect, it affects all the elements, but the signal becomes less. So, physical processes occur during nebulization they have a large influence on the sensitivity and selectivity. It de nebulization efficiency depends on the nature of the nebulizing gas and the sample solvent. So, the interference can be controlled by preparation of standard solutions and the by matching the solutions etcetera and that is by standard deviation. This we will discuss a little bit during the application of the atomic absorption. So, presence of high concentrations of dissolved salts etcetera this we have already covered a little bit and uh, uh, so I will not be covering much, but the uh, except to highlight the normal sample solution uh, should be about 6 to 7 milliliter per minute and nebulization efficiency is about 10 percent. Nowadays you get about 15 to 20 percent nebulization efficiency is very well accepted. So, as it is um, um, it is the physical interferences occur from sample introduction stage before nebulization. So, till it reaches the burner whereas, chemical interferences dominate in the atomization phase that is in the flame or in the electrothermal atomization. So, what happens is uh, uh, this, uh, this I had shown you earlier sample solution, M x solution, ioni solid aerosol, solid from the solid aerosol gaseous formation, from the gaseous there is excitation, association, dissociation and ionization and recombination. But none of these things are suitable for atomic absorption and these things are also not suitable for atomic absorption, only the metal ions are um, suitable even if it forms a um, excited state and emission this is atomic absorption, but if the ions undergo excitation or emission this also does not lead to any atomic absorption. So, the sample solution enters the nebulization where it gets fragmented into the fine droplets of about 10 micron size. The bigger size droplets go waste and aerosol enters the flame and all the processes which I had discussed earlier occur. So, the free atoms undergo a variety of reactions all these things we have already discussed there is not much to discuss except that CH, NH and OH radicals are formed and chemical interferences can, can occur and prevent enhance or suppress the formation of background interference background state atoms in the flame and uh, uh, we will consider this calcium atoms and in calcium atoms I have this calcium chloride NH 2 O solution that is N is not defined because it is solvated molecule. So, in the solvated molecule from the solvated molecule in the sample I produce a liquid gas aerosol and water will evaporate I have a solid uh, calcium chloride solution from the solid I have a gaseous one from the gaseous this thing I have a um, the concentration of calcium ions and chlorine gas and these two can combine and ca from calcium I can get excited atoms here calcium and if it is uh, ionization it is waste recombination with oxygen coming from the flame or from the uh, air outside the flame it leads to calcium oxide which is not good for atomic absorption. So, this is a typical scheme. So, calcium when it is present as calcium chloride these are the reactions that take place. One is formation of calcium chloride water and that is calcium atoms and CaCl2 H2O can also react to give you calcium and hydrochloric acid. See, you can imagine that several types of reactions that do occur in the flame and formation of hydrochloric acid is one of them. So, if you have a calcium nitrate solution, 
then nitric acid also may form in the flame. So, typical uh, we want to avoid as far as possible the formation of the acids in the sample. So, calcium oxide is uh, dissociating to give you calcium and oxygen and uh, when it is present as nitrate, oh I have already written here when it is nitrate, it is calcium oxide, nitrate and uh, water molecules and calcium oxide also will go to calcium atoms and oxygen atoms. Okay. So, in chloride medium calcium chloride dissociates to give you this formation of calcium chloride in the flame is very less inside the flame. However, if you take calcium nitrate then uh, the calcium atoms will come. This is the reason why we during atom in all atomic absorption spectrometers what we do is uh, we take the uh, standard solution as nitrates instead of chlorides. So, most of the nitrate salts are used as standard preparation solutions. So, if you want to uh, prepare calcium go for calcium nitrate, want to prepare uh, co determine copper prepare copper nitrate. Uh, take NLR grade copper nitrate solid dissolve it in water to give you 1 to 5 ppm or whatever is the beer law beer's law range. So, the if you take sulphate there will be probability that uh, these sulphates are not easily dissociated chloride if you take hydrochloric acid formation may take place etcetera. And then uh, in the case of calcium nitrate it dissociates first into calcium oxide and from this calcium uh, atoms should come. So, comparatively there is less number of calcium atoms from the nitrate medium than from chloride medium. So, the most common chemical interference is compound formation. So, most of the elements in particular in particular alkaline earth elements what are they? beryllium, calcium, strontium, barium etcetera they form highly refractory metal oxides in the flame resulting in the loss of these atoms. If they form oxides there is loss of free atoms that is understood. Okay. So, the dissociation of the metal oxides back into free metal atoms depends on the temperature of the flame. If the flame temperature is high there is more absorb more redissociation more number of free atoms. The higher the temperature more is the dissociation and better sensitivity. And whenever we talk of atomic absorption what we talk is about the sensitivity especially interference means we are talking about the sensitivity. That means, absorbance should be as high as possible for a given sample. So, the air acetylene gives a temperature of about 2600 degree centigrade. At this temperature most of the metal oxides dissociate except refractory metals like uh, niobium, tantalum, aluminum, zirconium etcetera. You know in, you can include tungsten and all that and alkali earth metal oxides also form some sort of a refractory compounds. So, a flame which gives a temperature higher than air acetylene is required that is nitrous oxide, acetylene nitrous oxide is the one which gives you around 3000 degree centigrade whenever there is a possibility of the formation of oxides. You can study a little bit about the chemistry of these elements and usually the atomic absorption whenever you buy an uh, atomic absorption they give you some sort of a cookbook which will recommend conditions for the determination of each element. So, sometimes they are incorporated in the computer itself. So, the moment you select copper or calcium it will list all the things and precautions also. So, uh, that comes on the computer screen, but um, that, uh, that apart the nitrous oxide acetylene uh, flame 
is around 2900 degree centigrade which give it is better, better for us to understand that the whenever there is possibility of oxide formation go for nitrous oxide acetylene flame. Normally, the elements whose dissociation energy is more than 5 electron volts they cannot be determined by air acetylene. This is a general rule any element whose uh, dissociation energy is more than this we suggest go for nitrous oxide acetylene that provides the necessary sensitivity. It is not always the temperature of the flame that is important basically what it means is quite often uh, the ratio of carbon to oxygen in the flame determines the sensitivity. So, a reducing flame that provides more fuel than stoichiometric requirement is re desirable. That means, for uh, refractory metals what we need is a reducing flame. Why? Because they are all oxides, oxides need to be reduced to the metals. So, a reducing flame that is a blue flame that is required in the case of refractory metal oxides. So, one should always optimize the flame conditions in the fuel to fuel oxidant ratio uh, and then you should also optimize height because reducing flame any flame structure we have seen earlier there is a reducing flame then there is oxidizing flame then there is secondary zone where all other uh, components from the air will come and mix and giving you a red flame. So, all these uh, conditions need to be optimized in the case of every atomic absorption flame atomic absorption that is where you should uh, aspirate what is the height of the burner uh, to relative to the hollow cathode lamp etcetera. So, to all this is to be done only because we need a higher sensitivity. So, in our laboratory we have carried out some investigations using sugar to alter the carbon oxygen ratio. So, why not we determine change in the carbon oxygen ratio how best way is to introduce sugar along with the sample sugar dissolves very easily in all water solutions acidic solutions etcetera. So, if you introduce sugar there will be a lot of carbon atoms coming from the sample itself into the flame. So, the carbon oxygen ratio changes. So, this kind of experiments we have done in my laboratory and uh, we have seen some results that it has been observed that uh, molybdenum, tungsten, titanium etcetera for all these elements what you see in this slide molybdenum, aluminum, barium, yttrium, dysprosium, holmium etcetera there is enhancement in the absorbance value whenever I put sugar. But there is no enhancement in the refractory elements like copper, uh, cadmium, cobalt and uh, nickel. Other type of compound formation is the alkaline earth forming refractory phosphates. For example, you can see that uh, some elements form phosphates instead of oxides. If you add a dissolve the sample in phosphoric acid, they form phosphates. Quite often if you want to determine many elements in the soil calcium, sodium etcetera um, in the soil then soil also will have phosphate phos because phosphorus phosphates are natural uh, fertilizers. So, there is a lot of fertilizer in the soil and uh, whenever you aspirate dissolve the sample and aspirate they form phosphates also. Sometimes they form double oxides that is with aluminum, silicon etcetera. Strontium reacts with aluminum or silicon to form metal uh, ox mixed metal oxides that is SRO Al 2 O 3, SRO SiO 2 etcetera. Similarly, with phosphate it forms calcium phosphate. So, during evaporation of liquid droplets in the flame this compound is cal converted to calcium pyrophosphate instead of calcium atoms. So, and but uh, it is very stable in the air acetylene flame. Therefore, you must be very careful whenever you want to determine 
calcium etc some elements which have got phosphate in the sample because the many of the elements form pyrophosphates which are very stable. Okay. So, this reaction so that is the formation of uh, phosphates reduces the free atom population in the flame compared to that obtained from solutions in the absence of the phosphate. So, this type of interference we can eliminate. Why? Because phosphate reduces the signal that is the bottom line. So, how do we uh, take care of the phosphate interference? Add a releasing agent. So, what is the releasing agent? I just incorporate a little bit of lanthanum in this sample in this and in the standards that combines with the interfering ion. So, it releases the analyte atom that means lanthanum pyrophosphate will form releasing the calcium atoms. In other cases we can add EDTA that combines preferentially with elements and then that can dissociate in the flame that releases the analyte atoms. So, uh, the addition of lanthanum or strontium that is also another releasing agent that releases the calcium atoms from the calcium phosphate preferably forming lanthanum and strontium phosphates. Addition of EDTA forms calcium EDTA complex and that is volatile. We have published a research paper on the determination of indium in geological samples by adding a mixture of tripotassium citrate and ascorbic acid in place of lanthanum because lanthanum is very costly element. So, um, this combination also we have tried. So, this type of interference can also be eliminated by the method of standard addition. This I will explain to you later when we di discuss the atomic absorption spectrometer applications. So, in this method multiplicative interferences can also be taken care of um, and not the additive interferences. So, uh, the additive interference always takes place in condensed phase this you should remember. Okay. So, we will discuss the ionization interferences and other interferences in the next class. Thank you very much.